Well, it's late in the day there, and I guess you're all very tired, and uh, it's very early in the morning here, and so I'm a bit uh, still waking up. So uh, let's see how it goes, and uh, perhaps this will be sufficiently provocative to keep everybody awake. So the topic is logic without metaphysics, and the general theme is that uh, in logic, Metaphysical ideas can be useful as metaphors, as heuristic devices, uh, and as initial stimulants that uh, help give uh, kickstart to in formal investigations. But uh, in my view, they should be kept at arm's length uh, and never taken literally. So rather than talk on a general level, I'm going to uh, proceed by examples, and I've got four of them. Uh, one of them, the notion of indefinite classes that we find in uh, Boo, in his two books of 1847, 1854. Uh, Frege's notion of senses, uh, possible worlds, and uh, the the space travel and dialetheism that is sometimes associated with them. And finally, and perhaps I'll give most time to this, the notion of uh, harmony, harmony uh, for uh, introduction and elimination rules uh, uh, in logic. So let's have a, a very brief look at Boole. This is um, reflecting some work I did recently. Uh, uh, and uh, Boole uh, in 1847 was in a bit of a quandary. He wanted to represent all propositions as equality. Actually, he was not the first to want to do this. Uh, I've just been looking back at earlier 19th century stuff and there's a very fascinating book by uh, George Bentham, the nephew of Jeremy Bentham. Uh, which brings together some of his uncle's uh, posthumous manuscripts, and he too also wanted to do that. And also uh, Sir William Hamilton wanted to do that. So it was in the air. He wanted to represent all propositions as equalities, but that made a problem for him uh, when dealing with uh, propositions. We're looking at traditional propositions now, traditional categorical propositions of the kind, some X's are Y. And uh, if we write as Boole did, little x, little y to be the class of, of all x's and y's, how can we express this as an equality? And he uh, had some problems. Now, not long after, well, it's nearly 30 years after, Cayley wrote uh, a little article. Uh, Cayley, who is now best remembered as one of the founders of graph theory, I think by profession, he was a chemist. I uh, hear a little article. He said, Well, listen, uh, why all the fuss? Let's just write it as an inequality. Uh, X intersection Y is non empty. Uh, and that's all you need to do. But Boole, for reasons which are not entirely clear, really wanted to make everything into an equality. So he expressed. Some x's are y's, or one of the ways in which he expressed it as vx equals y, where v is, and maybe quote, the symbol of a class indefinite in all respects, but this one, that it contains some individuals of the class to whose expression it is prefixed. And as soon as you see that, you begin to think, oh, well, I've seen something like that before. There were the uh, abstract triangles, which are neither equilateral, nor isosceles, nor scaling, but potentially all of those, which were ridiculed by uh, uh, Berkeley more than Berkeley more than a century earlier. So it's not a very clear notion at all. So when you see, read this in Boulder, you have uh, various options of reaction. You can take it literally, despite its obscurity, and that's what Bill did. He seemed to be quite happy with it. You can see it as a vague gesture or a metaphor, but then you have to decide, well, how am I going to handle that? And you can 
tolerate it grudgingly. That's what Jevons and Venn did. Or you can just say, let's get rid of it. And that's what Kaylee did. And in a very well-known uh, review article, that's what Dummett did. And shortly afterwards, uh, Van Evra as well. Or you can try to make good sense of it. And Hale Perrin in, 18, in 1986, and myself uh, in the last year have been work, worked on that. And I think we've done a good job. Uh, uh, it's important to note that these two are not exclusive. Even if we succeed in making good sense of the notion, good mathematical sense, then the resulting structures might turn out to be inconveniently complex. And so in the end, we might say, well, let's just bypass and get rid of them in the sense that we don't use them, not throw them in a rubbish bin, but uh, put them aside. And uh, that can be done. And uh, you, one can uh, therefore take the initial notion of an indefinite uh, class uh, and uh, try and uh, not tolerate it, not uh, just, just uh, tolerate it grudging it, but uh, do something uh, which leaves you with uh, something mathematically interesting. And indeed, which I think helps understand the things that Sir William Hamilton was doing with his quantification of the predicate, but that's work that I'm on, going on in the moment. And it leads into third order logic. It's, uh, I, I find it very interesting. The other next example I want to look at is Frege's treatment of senses. And uh, we all know that in 1879, Frege uh, in his Begriffsrift introduced a new logical notation with relatively little discussion of any kind of supporting ontology. But then in subsequent texts, not all of them published, some of them were refused for publication initially, some of them were just notes. But anyway, they come out in the Nark class. In subsequent texts, Frege articulated a quite complex ontological system in association with uh, the new notation and especially relating to its treatment of identity. Now, he's in uh, occasional correspondence with Husserl, and Husserl had difficulties understanding what he was doing with this uh, ontology. And so Frege, perhaps a little condescendingly, but very usefully, made a diagram for it. And here is the diagram reproduced uh, from uh, one of, the, one of the books with his uh, posthumous writings. Uh, uh, on the top line, you see some, uh, which I'm not going to get into details of the individual uh, items, it's rather the relationships between them that uh, I find interesting. Anyway, you have quasi-linguistic items in the top row, propositions, with uh, proper names and uh, concept words. I would prefer to have a hyphen in there. In other words, which function as concepts, which are components in some sense of the proposition. And then they give rise to or associated with senses of each of them respectively. And they give rise to or associated with Bodeutens or references, usual translation, of those senses and thereby indirectly references of the top row items. Uh, uh, and there's this funny little addition under here, which I don't want to get into, uh, which seems to be redundant. Now, that's just a thumbnail sketch. And if you trawl through Frege's writing, it can be elaborated into a much more comprehensive and complicated diagram, uh, which uh, again, uh, I don't want to get into the details right here. I presented it in a recent paper in Logica Universalis, uh, much more complicated, but it will do for our purposes today. I, don't, 
uh, what I want to do is look at the middle row. And they are, as we saw, the senses of the quasi-linguistic items in the uh, row above, the, in the top row. And uh, they're pretty obscure. And they've become the subject since about 1980, 1970, they've become the subject of endless hermeneutic debates. What did we mean by this? What did we mean by that? And what happens? Well, what does modern logic do? In current uh, formal logic, it just gets rid of it and gets rid of all the metaphysical questions which are associated with it. And the ontology of first order logic as it exists today, uh, if you look at the ontology in particular, of uh, atomic propositions that to simplify we take uh, those with a with a, um, uh, with a individual constant and a, uh, a one place uh, predicate letter you have a very similar looking diagram in structure but with a quite different content uh, on the top row you have really linguistic items the sentence in english consisting of a proper name and a predicate with the plus standing for some kind of concatenation. And they are symbolized and in the middle row, you don't have senses anymore. You don't have these abstract, uh, obscure abstract entities. You have uh, symbols. You have linguistic entities, once more, but of a formalized language. Uh, you have a sentence, you have a constant, the symbol and you have the predicate sign and they are linked by concatenation reverse usually you write the predicate sign before the constant sign and then they have values under any given interpretation or valuation uh, the constant gets a value in the domain of discourse the predicate sign gets a value uh, as a subset of the domain of discourse and uh, by the uh, Use the rule of truth, the formula gets a truth value true or false. So you've done entirely without the senses. And so there you have a second example of how um, a metaphysical notion can be a stimulus, but it should not be taken literally and should be held at arm's length and can be replaced by uh, non metaphysical material. Uh, which is essentially what I think I say on this slide. Uh, so the, what we can follow a policy of do without it, and that in this particular instance was a resounding success for uh, modern logic. As my third example, and this will probably uh, raise some hackles, uh, look at possible worlds and uh, Star Trek and dialectism. So, until 1963, modal logics were generally regarded as strange non classical logics, arousing, arousing a lot of suspicion among people such as Quine, but others too. And it was an area where the intuitions of investigators clashed seriously where formal, were, formal techniques were mainly on the syntactic side. Uh, there were semantics, but they tended to take a secondary role in publications. And they were algebraic and topological without a very close connection to the philosophical motivations that had stimulated the modal logics earlier in the century in the first place, namely the notions of necessity and possibility. And then in 1963, preceded by uh, first step in 59, Kripke's semantics using possible worlds linked by an accessibility relation changed the whole way of approaching modal logic. His semantics was versatile, with natural variations for different modal logics. It was easy to diagram, and using those diagrams, it was easy to make verifications of non-derivability, which could also be done 
with algebraic structures, but the algebraic structures tended to have uh, two to the power n elements in them where you had n in the uh, possible worlds model and uh, be rather less easy to diagram, less easy to follow visually. And there was a transfer of techniques from classical logic, uh, techniques of truth trees, and maxi consistent sets for proving uh, completeness theorems and other methods, all transferred rather nicely with uh, extra bells and whistles from classical to modal logic, all very nice. And even more nice, it was tweakable to neighboring areas such as counterfactual logics, beyondic logic, relevant logic, and so on. So it was a revolution. But there was a downside, or what I regard as a downside at least, as some people began taking these ideas, and I, I mean the ideas of possible worlds and accessibility and between possible worlds, in a, what's almost a literal sense instead of as being metaphors for helping visualize technical devices. And that became a sense, especially so when one gets into first order modal logic, where the evaluations of the for a formula uh, in a given world and, and need to, uh, to cross over indices uh, into other worlds when you're dealing not only with the modal connective, but uh, uh, also the quantifier, at least on some version. So you have questions like, well, really, does the accessibility relation have this or that property? Is it really transitive? Is it really satisfying the uh, symmetry, for example? And before long, what were stimulating metaphors for formal investigation became, I think, scholastic conundrums, which can be turned over and over and over again. And that went into overdrive, I believe, with uh, relevance logic. The routley mayer semantics for relevance logic was ultimately inspired by the Kripke semantics and modal logic, and it too was a great technical achievement. It was useful to get negative results. It could, well, could not be visualized quite so well because, uh, because of this three trace relation, um, uh, but it could be varied to get a uh, result for other substructural logics. And all of this, despite, yes, as I was saying, certain technical inconveniences, it uses three place relations rather than two, which are more difficult to get one's head around, more difficult to diagram, more difficult to visualize, uh, had rather complex and opaque construct constraints on those relations. And uh, these are technical inconveniences, but nevertheless, it was a very valuable step. Now, to make the semantics work, one must either admit impossible worlds where a contradiction can evaluate to true, or work in a four-valued logic, or both, or some other similar device. And that's fine mathematically, but should we be taking that kind of step literally? Uh, if you start taking it literally, you begin to see possible impossible worlds as just as real as our own world. And indeed, you might even start thinking that uh, perhaps our own world is one of them, that it is not just a possible world, but in fact an impossible world. And there you're getting into the metaphysics of dialectism. It's not just philosophy, it's uh, metaphysics. It enters into a universe of fantasy, I would say, that can in the end impede formal insights more than stimulate them. And it can distract us into endless uh, discussions of nebulous questions. Now I'll go into my last example. And I've taken uh, 20 minutes for 20 slides. So I think I'm doing more or less according to schedule. And the uh, the last example is harmony for introduction and elimination rules. 
And uh, this example is interesting, I think, uh, because it illustrates how an attempt to flee one kind of metaphysical entanglement in logic, or what is thought, sometimes thought of as a metaphysical entanglement, may lead to a worse one. In other words, an example of uh, jumping out of the frying pan into the fire. Now, the valuation system for classical logic assumes that propositions may have either one, but not both, either one, but not both of the values true and false. And that has given rise, among some at least, to a philosophical worry. Such a logic cannot really get off the ground unless we already know what truth and falsehood really are. We need a philosophically satisfying definition for those notions before we deploy them in classical logic. So that's the uh, metaphysical entanglement that some people were afraid of. I think it's, um, it's a scarecrow rather than a reality, but uh, let's go from there. Uh, it is contended in that context that uh, the recursive Tarski style definitions within a given formal language don't suffice to make such clarifications because those recursive definitions of truth make uncritical use of the very notion of truth in their base clauses for atomic formulae. And because a philosophically satisfying definition should not be confined to the formulae of some specific formal language. And if one is looking at that kind of position, which is associated with some illustrious names in 20th century philosophical logic, uh, there are various options one can take. One can contest the philosophical criticism, and I believe that's a live option, but I don't want to get into it. And I'm not here, and that's not at all. You can take a don't care attitude and say, for logic, just consider evaluation functions that take either two values, call them one and zero, or call them plus and minus, or whatever you like, and don't worry about what they really are. It doesn't matter. Or you can accept it as being at least as a serious worry and look for another way of constructing logic. And that last avenue is the origin of good theoretic semantics. The idea is to reconstruct the meanings of the truth functional connective as being determined by which valid inferences they can enter into. In particular, to focus in order to get some kind of uh, hold on a very complex uh, array of possible powers, inferential powers, in particular focus on the powers of uh, interleaved rules, in other words, introduction and elimination rules for each of the uh, propositional connectives and the quantifiers considered separately. Define each connective in by a suitable pair of such rules, so you're not talking about truth any longer, or truth, or truth under evaluation, and uh, one introduction rule, one elimination rule, following more or less in, in the footsteps of Denson for each of those connectives. And that's fine, that's lovely. Uh, it's extremely interesting, even for the logician who's absolutely happy with truth tables, absolutely happy with the uh, referring to truth and falsehood and the classical treatment of the quantifiers. And it's interesting to see, well, how does this pan out? How does it develop? The problem is that from the very beginning, I've had to face a te uh, technical hitch. And in reaction, it began acquiring what I see as epicycles. Technical hitch was Pryor's, Arthur Pryor's two page 1960 paper the runabout inference figure, all about Tonk. And the moral of the paper was that not any old inter, uh, interim pair, not any old pair of introduction and elimination rules for a, uh, for a uh, 
potential connective can define uh, that connective. Some of them generate triviality in the associated or generated logic. Uh, so we need uh, independent criteria uh, to determine which pairs of infinite rules can really do uh, an acceptable, even a formally acceptable job. I'm going to make a little nostalgic digression here. There are some beautiful, very short papers in the literature that don't have very much technical apparatus and which I think help many of us shape our thinking about logic. My own favorites are the following three or four. Uh, one I mentioned earlier, Cayley's two-page paper of 1871, a note on the calculus of logic, which, as I said, said get rid of the indefinite symbols and represent the, the traditional categorical particulars of, uh, of non-equality. Then Lewis Carroll's three-page paper, What the Thought is Said to Achilles in 1895. Gödel's little three-page paper on the intuitionistic propositional calculus in 1932, which was followed up by a paper which made a huge impression on me as a student, uh, the Gunji's two-page transfer of Gödel's ideas to show uh, essentially the same result for modal logic in 1940, namely uh, that uh, none of the usual modal propositional logics have a finite characteristic matrix. Beautiful little paper. And then there's Pryor's two-page punk paper. And uh, when I wrote my own three-page paradox for the preface as a graduate student, I had these as uh, pin-ups. And, uh, and so anyway, let's get back to Tonk. According to Pryor, not any interlinked pair can define a connective. Some, like those for Tonka, generate uh, triviality. And we need uh, independent criteria. Now, there's a naive response to that. For each classical connective, study the set of all interlinked rules that it satisfies under classical consequences. And for an unrepentant classicist who accepts uh, classical proof values, uh, that's a perfectly good uh, way of proceeding and gives rise to interesting questions about existence and uniqueness of uh, such rules. And I've taken a hand in looking at those existence and uniqueness questions. But if you're running away from truth, falsehood and classical consequence, then that kind of response to Tonk is a no-no. Instead, you may want to do something else. You may want to search for harmony. In other words, you might set yourself the goal of articulating a syntactic condition on interlim rules that can serve as a gold standard for, uh, for discriminating the satisfying definitions of propositional connectives and separating them from the uh, inadequate ones. And we all know, at least those of who were brought up in uh, Anglophone schools, Keats's famous poem where he says, Beauty is truth, truth, beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know. And the harmony seeker, in a way, is saying, Yes, beauty. Trump's truth, and that's what we're after. So where does that lead? It leads to a very interesting program. Again, that's uh, it's, uh, this harmony notion is the base of metaphysical notion, but it, uh, it's a stimulating one. Even if the criteria for success is vague, it doesn't matter, but it's stimulating. But where does it lead? If one works with set-set sequence, Jensen style, uh, the natural symmetric accounts of uh, introduction elimination rules lead us right back to classical logic and so it seems like we're doing a very long detour to get back at least as far as logic is concerned to where we started from i suppose that one could take that as attitude 
okay, we've got back to classical logic to be free of the, the troublesome notions of truth and falsehood, but you've paid a very big price for it. It's much more complicated. Um, if one restricts oneself to the set formula sequence, which is a very natural thing to do because uh, they correspond to the way in which one argues in uh, uh, every day, well, not every day, uh, in uh, normal deductive reasoning. The asymmetry in the definition of a sequence, because it's the formula on the right and the set or other structured uh, multiplicity on the left. Uh, that uh, asymmetry creates serious asymmetries also in the interlim, in the behavior of the interlim rules themselves. And the result of that asymmetry is that unless one fudges the definition of an introduction rule to allow ad hoc asymmetries within the set formula rules, such as uh, more than one occurrence of the uh, connected being defined or allowing it to occur in funny positions. I don't want to get into the technical details, but unless one fudges the definition of these ad hoc asymmetries in the rules, neither the falsehood nor any other contrarian two functional alternative satisfies any set formula introduction rule, not even the degenerate one. So there's two technical terms there. Uh, a degenerate introduction rule, that's one which is a substitution instance of a purely structural one in which no connective appears. And a contrarian true functional connective is one that comes out false when all the uh, sentence letters, all the variables uh, associated uh, that make up its arguments when they're all assigned the value tr uh, true. That comes out false when it, all its components are true. And so introduction elimination symmetry becomes impossible in a set formula uh, context. So there are two perspectives I think that emerge when one realizes that and, and doesn't go into a state of denial. Uh, there's the mystical approach. One can say, well, perfect symmetry or harmony as it's usually called, must somehow hold for interlim rules, even in a set formula context, and we should invest energy in unearthing it. And then there's a pragmatic approach, working with a set formula sequence certainly accords with informal deductive practice. If those sequences are not fully symmetric, so we should not be surprised if the satisfaction pattern for interim rules comes out as rather asymmetric and uh, we should avoid uh, these any search for a mystical kind of harmony. So I've got some general remarks which I think put all this together. Practical advice. If a metaphor shows signs of being taken too seriously in logic, continue to make heuristic use of it, but resist the drift towards taking it literally. Because a drift can set it. Don't lose too much time arguing against the metaphysics, because it's usually far too nebulous to get to grips with properly, and you risk being dragged into endless problems. Just leave it aside or try, try to make it either get rid of it or try to make good mathematical sense of it. I am assuming that uh, my listener has its first priority logic, but uh, if you are just mining logic to get fuel for another game where nebulosity and polemic are perhaps more tolerated, then you're certainly are going to ignore my advice. So I conclude with recalling an apocryphal story about Napoleon and Laplace. Uh, where Napoleon called Laplace in. Laplace, Laplace had indeed been Napoleon's teacher, I believe, but he called him back in to ask him about his book on celestial mechanics and asked, where does God fit into your system? Laplace said, 
sir, I have no need for that hypothesis. That is all I want to say now. If you any of this uh, you find interesting, uh, just Google my webpage and you find uh, a recent paper on bills and definite symbols, uh, one on, on Frege's ontological diagram completed, and on uh, relevance logic, uh, one called crashing with clarity, and on intuitionistic logic and elementary rules with uh, Lloyd Humberston in 2011, and the related paper on those two. So that's all I want to say, and I think I'm within my time limits.